anyway, okay. Uh, our Spanish course, Mapas, Maps, Andinos of the Andes. <laughs> so at least you, you know two words in Spanish. <laughs> And now we, we test our pronunciation, mapas antinos. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a, a funny story which derives in part from my profession as a cartographer, my profession as a university prof, and my profession as a mountain guide. Why? Because... This guy here, Francisco Medina, um, actually, uh, no, he personally was, or, no, no, I think he was still born in what, what is now Poland, the German part of Poland. Uh, Schlotterbeck is a German name. His name was Franz Schlotterbeck, and I... I don't know, maybe his, his father, I believe, married a South American uh, Spanish-speaking lady in Chile, but he is um, a German aristocrat, uh, so something like a duke, right? And he emigrated, or already his dad emigrated to Chile, to South America, and Francisco, uh, studied geography and made, underwent the uh, official training to become a professional mountain guide. And then he got, he got much more interested in mountain guiding. So we have something in common, geologist, mountain guide, geographer, mountain guide. I decided to stay in academia. He decided to become a major mountain guide with a enormous background knowledge in geography, of course, which was for the benefit of his clients because he could tell them, you know, this is a what specific type of volcano and you see these flowers there, vegetation, blah, blah, blah. So, and we, we became befriended through my research um, in Alta Atacama in, uh, and my mapping expeditions to Ojos del Salado where he went with his clients and uh, Francisco and I became sort of friends. And one day, either he sent me an email, no, he, we, we, we met in Santiago de Chile and he said, by the way, Manfred, I need good maps. I said, yeah, <laughs> anyway, anyway, you have them anytime. But he said, I need them for, for a particular area. And he, of course, as president of the Chilean mountain guides, he was well aware of any mountain maps of the Andes, and he knew that in the area where he wanted to get material, that is, near the hotel, four-star hotel, or five-star, even, I guess, four or five-star hotel, Puma Lodge, he needed something for heli skiing, helicopter skiing. And... Uh, there's a funny story with this uh, Puma Lodge because um, Puma Lodge actually belongs to a gentleman who is the son of the chief geologist of the biggest copper mine in Chile and I believe at that time in the world, close uh, to Talca, south of Santiago de Chile, a big, big undermine uh, underground mine with tens of kilometers, tens of kilometers of tunnels and shafts. And the father of this chief, his father, yeah, the, the, the father, no, this chief geologist also has German roots and emigrated to Chile. And his son then also became studied geology and became also the successor of the father as a chief geologist of this big, big copper mine. And he also gained money. And he said, okay, 
Why not I buy a helicopter skiing concession in the Andes? I'm fond of skiing and I think this is a good new business idea. I uh, construct a nice mountain hotel there, Puma Lodge. And you know what the Pumas are, the, these sort of tigers, huh? uh, mountain tigers. And uh, and then I, I place a helicopter there and I make good money with uh, helicopter skiing. However, there were no maps. Huh? And then he got in touch with Francisco, my friend, Francisco Medina, and said, Francisco, you have very good connections everywhere. Please set the stage for helicopter skiing. I provide the hotel, I provide the helicopters, and you do the rest. You manage the hotel, you manage the whole heli helicopter skiing. So this is the background. And there's still another interesting story. During the ta communist time, when there was still the German Democratic Republic before 1990, there was one big, big chemical, chemical plant in East Germany, Bitterfeld. And whenever I flew from, say, Vienna to Stockholm for, for 10 years, I also was invited prof at the university in Stockholm. So whenever I crossed over East Germany, you saw big, big clouds of dirt moving up, smoke actually, uh, poisonous smoke. I don't know what they produced. Anyway, everybody knew this is poisonous. And the percentage of people who died there in the Bitterfeld area with cancer was significant. But, you know, communist regime, you didn't hear a lot. But since my grandma, my mother's mom, and three of my aunts were living in East Germany, not too far from Bitterfeld, I knew about this. Huh? And what happened after the reunification of Germany after 1990? This chief geologist who also constructed Puma Lodge, he bought Bitterfeld because it broke down during the, what we call, politische Wende, political turn or change. And he said, ha, huh, there's a big, big factory. I have a lot, lot of money. I, I just buy it. And I check out what I can do with it. Maybe I can make a new factory out of it, whatever. So the guy who I met in the Andes, there at Puma Lodge, he frequently was just a little bit north of Dresden, in the east of Germany, in Bitterfeld, thinking and managing the restart of this big, big chemical plant. Funny, huh? So, two strange things. My mom originates also from the German-speaking part of Poland. Before World War II, many Germans lived in what today is Poland, right? So, and this Francisco Medina, he came from this era, my mom too. Uh, and then I meet the boss, uh, the owner of this Puma Lodge, the owner of this helicopter, and he actually also is a strange, uh, so funny. Huh? So I need good maps, I say, okay, tell me what you need, and we make them for you, my students, my assistants, and I. And so we decided that I go there for a one week stay to Puma Lodge and check out how the situation is and what, what we actually need. And at that time, of course, the big owner was there. I guess he, he died already, so I can tell it with his girlfriend and the baby of his girlfriend. His wife stayed somewhere, I don't know where, and with his young girlfriend, he was there, introduced me to her as it would be natural because they have a different thinking in South America. You know, there's the wife, and maybe there's girlfriend number one, number two, three, something like this. So anyway, that's how it is. Uh, and with, with this uh, lady, and I even think the baby, we then jumped onto the helicopter and flew over the whole area. So of course, he showed me the surrounding of Puma Lodge. It looks nice, huh? it's wooden outside, and, and you will see more of it. Uh, four, four or five star, I don't know. So high quality. In the middle of nowhere, you need a four-wheel drive to get there huh? in the mountains. 
bad roads. And then we flew around, and he showed me all the areas, Francisco, this uh, owner, and myself, and the, the girlfriend, and the baby. And the helicopter was like a buzz, buzz, busy bee. Very silent. Not what you are supposed to. You ta, 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 ta. It was zzzz. He says, this is the most modern helicopter on Earth, the most expensive you can get. It was only for, I think, six or eight people. Not, not a very big one, but big enough for us, of course. And we set off and said, did, did the pilot start the, the engine? Yeah, you didn't hear anything. So, fantastic. So, in this respect, because I'm very much against helicopter skiing. In the Alps, I hate it. And, and ah, the noise, uh, it, it, it's not ecological, is it? No. So, but in this case, a large, large area of, we will see it very soon, how many square kilometers, up to 5,000 meters, and there's one little bee humming around. It's like nothing. Huh? And it's also not spoiling the area with crowds of ski tourists, but there's only a group maybe of four or five tourists, one mountain guide or ski instructor, and that's it. And maybe there are at the same time three of these groups over a large, large area, maybe as large as from here to the German border and, and Czech border and, 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 uh, and, and Austrian border. So, um, yeah, very special. And here I wanted to show you a short video um, about helicopter skiing, but we can still try. I think it does not work. No, it does not. Timeline. Uh, March 2010. Francisco addressed me in Santiago and said, Manfred, it's not only beer drinking now, it's business. We need, I need good maps. In April, I informed the students about the project possibilities. And in November uh, 2011, I went there for maybe it was 10 days inspecting the mapping region, was what I just told you. Um, in March next year, 2012, uh, I, my successor, we had an overlap of, of the professors, so it was obvious that I would in five years retire, and we had already placed a position for the, the a young guy who is now my successor and is now in Dresden, the prof of cartography. He joined me because he was not at all familiar with mountain mapping, so he went there, a, an assistant of mine who also knows uh, Professor Kopacz very well because we jointly went to Tibet and to, to Nepal, and I think seven or eight students, rather eight students. So this was in March, the whole team went there, and uh, yeah, as you see, 1st of March until 7th of April, we stayed in the field in Puma Lodge and then finished our field mapping activities. And already, uh, uh, a few weeks later, we began with map production uh, and we delivered already a first product and then continuously within, I guess, one and a half years or two years, all these needed map products. It was uh, what was planned or what was uh, asked to be submitted was a very comprehensive map package. First, topographic overview maps at the scale of 50,000 and 100,000. Why? Why did they not use the Chilean maps? Because simply, I'll show you, I'll show you the proof. They existed, but they were of mediocre, of medium quality, if not to say low quality. Uh, and there were, even, there, there were even white spots, white patches there. Nobody went there to map it. They, they had uh, no, no good uh, stereo overview when they, um, when they used the, uh, mapped the uh, stereo aerial photography. Uh, or there was shadow. Anyway, there were, were, were white patches, which is not acceptable. So anyway, we had to generate these topographic maps. 
uh, for some areas where there were uh, the, the actual uh, powder snow tracks leading down from summits, we, they asked us for one to 20,000 maps, so very detailed maps. Uh, they wanted a hiking sketch map of Puma Lodge and its surroundings, and eventually an access map how to reach Puma Lodge once you land at Santiago Airport, how can you get there? Do you have, uh, assuming you are renting a car and going there with a rented car. Um, and finally, risk maps of the individual off-piste ski runs. Why risk map? Of course, snow avalanches. If you are in the wilderness of the Andes, and it's not like uh, skiing centers here in the Czech Republic or even in Austria or Switzerland, where you have a, a mountain rescue team 24 hours a day, but there is simply nothing. You could try to, to ring a, an emergency number somewhere in Santiago de Chile, and then the question is, uh, is there somebody picking up the phone? Is there a person available who knows what to do? How long does it take to come from there? So, uh, um, risk maps are of high, high, high importance. And this is also why uh, Francisco addressed me, knowing I'm a mountain guide, I'm a ski instructor. I know very well about the, the avalanche risk, right? And last but not least, not too far from, from the uh, from the hotel, from Puma Lodge, they wanted to uh, make a trail. They actually made a trail up to a very nice little summit and they wanted to place a 360 degrees outlook there. And some information uh, concerning the names of the peaks you are seeing here, right? Okay, so we set off in March uh, 2011, I guess it was, right? Uh, from Dresden via Frankfurt am Main to Santiago de Chile. And then from Santiago de Chile down to Puma Lodge. We've seen the winter uh, image before. I can still go back for you that you see uh, the winter image. Oops. Ah! Anyway. What happened? Come on. Yeah, anyway, snow cover in winter, and th this is how, oops, how it looks in summer. And nice pool, nice setting, but you don't see a, a big parking lot, you don't see a, a nice mountain road. It's really in the middle of nowhere, sort of. Huh? And this is myself here, swimming dolphin here, back stroke, Professor Burkhardt. Myself, one university assistant, also immediately in the pool, and seven students. They were supposed to be up in the mountains while the profs are enjoying the pool. No, it was not like this, you will see. This is just fun. Huh? But anyway, so every three days or so we went back to the hotel and then you could a little bit enjoy this one or even the sauna or scenarium and then the spa. Uh, here you see, he, this guy here is currently supposed to teach at TU Dresden while I'm teaching in Prague. He's my successor. This is uh, my former assistant who is now uh, on a contract basis, uh, week-wise uh, working with my successor and also he will join Professor Kropacek still this year to Nepal. And yeah, some of our students, this is not all, and myself. Uh, yeah, and eventually this lady still joined us. There was only one in, in the beginning and, oops, due to some, uh, some delay with the plane or some uh, plane trouble, she only came three days later. And this is where we are. The mapping region is located in the central part of the Chilean Alps, uh, Chilean Andes. Uh, you have to imagine from up here, from the far north, here would be Titicaca Lake, the biggest mountain lake in the world. Which is the second biggest? 
right isikul in Kyrgyzstan. Wow, how come you know? <laughs> anyway, so this is this here is uh, Titicaca Lake in, in Bolivia, uh, in Peru. Here you have Bolivia, here you have uh, Argentina, and this here is Peru, right? Okay, and this distance from here down to southern Patagonia is more than 4,500 kilometers. How far is it from the northernmost part of India to the southern tip? Less, less anyway, huh? so you can imagine. And this is fantastic. This is also why I love Chile from the far north. I, I traveled all that uh, down to, uh, not exactly down here, but maybe down somewhere down here. Huh? This, and, and you are going through all these climate zones and so, fantastic. And anyway, we are here not too far from Santiago and that's where we went eventually. Um, the size, which I indicated in the beginning, I said I don't exactly know the figure or remember the figure anymore, 5,000 square kilometers of helicopter, helicopter skiing uh, concession. So a big, big area, 5,000 square kilometers. And this also means a lot of map production work. Huh? Uh, the, as you might, might guess from, uh, from this satellite image here, uh, the landscape consists of deeply incised valleys and peaks, elevation 1,300 to more than 5,000 meters. And once you are standing on a peak of 5,200 meters and you can ski down to 1,300, this is really something which you don't have everywhere. Some places in Kashmir are like this. Uh, actually, nothing in the Alps because we don't have peaks uh, of this altitude. Anyway, so this, this is really something. I, I enjoyed being there very much. And However, I have to say, here I never skied. I skied slightly north, but not in this area. Mm. Ideal region for deep snow, uh, or as we say, powder skiing, right? Uh, what are the input data and what was the preparatory works? We collected all the topographic maps from the Instituto Geográfico Militar from the Military Geographic Institute in Santiago. We collected any type of digital geodata from this very institute, which uh, are publicly available. And of course, we organized any type of satellite imagery, Landsat, Bing, uh, Google Earth uh, data. Uh, digital terrain models, no doubt of high importance in particular for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the disaster uh, or risk maps, right? And then uh, GPS data and field book, that's of course also something we had to bring with us. And having collected all that and prepared all that, here you see one of these, uh, it's not one of the ordinary, uh, the ordinary um, GPSs, but a, a high quality GPS system. Um, we went for field work. This is the available 1 to uh, 50,000 maps from, uh, from uh, Chile, from the government. And here you see already what I indicated. Uh, uh, just check here the quality is uh, there are no border lines, uh, no outline borders between the rocks popping out of the glaciers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but there was something already, including some areas where, strange enough, this is not a real white spot, but if you look here, here, there were some areas where the information was not complete in any case. If you look here, those were actual white patches. Huh? And those had to be filled. And this is the reason, which I mentioned before, why we were forced to generate our own uh, topographic maps at the scales of 50 and 100,000. Not to mention the, sorry, the uh, 20,000 uh, detailed maps for the ski runs. DTM, digital terrain model, you see also uh, with some 
some uh, are not real holes, but areas with uh, missing information. So to cut a long story short, we collected anything possible, high resolution satellite imagery you see here. There is the border between two different scenes. Um, yeah, DTM. I don't know what this is, actually, and any type of public or available DTM. And uh, this one here, maybe quite nice, but still uh, not complete. Huh? And eventually, we, we reached something like this, which is an optimization of all these input uh, sources uh, we, we used huh? a, a, with Northwest illumination, a shaded relief. Uh, depiction. I mentioned that uh, we ha were supposed to generate topographic maps. Here you see uh, the surrounding of the of the hotel. H is the hotel here, uh, so it's located. This is yeah, you might call it roads, but it is rather field tracks where you need a four wheel drive to drive them. Huh? Uh, th if you have a very good and very strong car, you might be able to reach the hotel here uh, with, without the four-wheel drive, but I wouldn't do it. Huh? Anyway, um, for the generation of our topographic maps, we had to make it, what I mentioned before, a synthesis of the information layers, like the trail network. We used GPS when we, when we went there. We hiked there. And satellite imagery, the hydro network, dividing between permanent rivers with a permanent flow and perennial flow, which means only after rainfall or in spring uh, when, when the snow melts. Uh, they were sort of permanent for a couple of weeks or months, and then uh, they were dry again. Various bound boundaries, but, uh, including, of course, the, the national boundary to, uh, to Argentina. Surface cover needed a lot of field work to find out where are the exact borders of, the, of these scrub or forest uh, covered areas and so on and so forth. Uh, and any relevant tourism information had to be put there. I mentioned that the people wanted to know how can I get from Santiago Airport to, uh, to Puma Lodge uh, here. And this is why we put these maps. This is, so to speak, the overview map, Santiago, Rancagua, Puma Lodge. Huh? How to get there? Ah, there might be a highway leading south, yeah. And once you uh, address Rancagua, you have to, have to turn east. If you miss this one, there's still another possibility to, to come to this road, which is called H265. Uh, and, and then you are able to reach Puma Lodge. Uh, in order to, uh, to know exactly how to get out of the airport, here a detailed map of Santiago area and then south, how to, how to uh, reach down to Rancagua. And this is the last part here uh, from a village called Coya. Here you see Coya, how to get from there to the actual hotel. And there is also a, 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 a picture, a photograph, that you know, ah, I have to look for a building which looks like this. Huh? OK. And here you see imprint, so the, the imprint information, Institute for Cartography, uh, 20, uh, 2012, Technische Universität Dresden. And uh, people loved this. And this was also sent to any clients prior to their flight, so they knew once I'm landing in Santiago, how can I get to, to Puma Lodge? Uh, then I said, uh, they, they required a sort of uh, hiking or, yeah, small hikes, little hikes, hiking uh, uh, map in the surrounding of, uh, of uh, Puma Lodge. Here in the northeast is Puma Lodge. There, which is very nicely embedded in the, into the landscape, is a very small helicopter hangar. And this is the helicopter pad, the landing and setting of uh, uh, region for the helicopters. Mm -hmm. uh, here you see the scale. This is, this is only 200 meters, though 
this might be uh, 600, 700 meters north-south. So it's, it's a very, and those are little hiking, not trails, hiking paths of, of, of short distance, uh, also including some playgrounds for the kids, uh, a, a, a little climbing area, rock climbing area with pitons and, and, and uh, fixed ropes and things like this. Here you see uh, already this uh, rock, uh, rock tower there. Um, yeah, so this is for the people uh, who, want, who don't want to make big hikes or big uh, uh, ski routes or helicopter skiing things, who just want to rest here, maybe enjoy, enjoy the pool and, and have a little bit of outing during the day. What you see here is the overview map of the whole area at the scale of one to 100,000. So you can imagine once we had to produce the 50,000 maps, basically you can divide it into four parts, whereas the southeastern part is only covering this little triangle here. But this, of course, the northwestern thing is a real, a real full-fledged uh, one to uh, 50,000 uh, scale um, sheet. Anyway, you see also uh, uh, the percentage of uh, glacier coverage here in the southwest, but also up here. And, and, and the highest peaks are up here and, and here. And yeah, I can only tell you once you are standing on this, uh, on this uh, summit here and ski down into the valley, as I, as I told you before, it's a big, big vertical drop. This is really impressive. Huh? And there was nothing before. Such a thing could be done anywhere in the Himalayas or so with a minimum of ecological impact, as I, as I described to you. Huh? You have one of these nice echo uh, mountain huts constructed with a lot of local wood and in a sort of yeah, ecological way huh? in all respects. Uh, okay, so this... Uh, this is just to show you the, the, the appearance, uh, appearance and the, also the coloring of, of all the maps. The, the, uh, uh, the 50,000 maps were of a similar, uh, similar uh, coloring. And this is now one of these maps which I mentioned, which show the individual ski runs. And in this respect, ski run means deep snow ski run, no prepared pistes, but you have to be an excellent skier. This is why in the beginning I wanted to show you how they ski down, how they jump out of the helicopter and then ski down, that you get a feeling of how the whole thing is. And I believe, I'm not 100% sure, that part of this uh, video, which hopefully we can still show uh, at the end of this lecture, uh, was, uh, was the, 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 green, the green run down here. And you have to imagine, um, here I, uh, I mentioned, so the design is by myself. It's questionable. It can be made better. You might have some critics. Ah, I don't like this. I don't. Anyway, but I put here a, an overview photograph, an oblique photograph of the whole ski run. Start at 4,150 meters and finish at 2,700 meters. So uh, it's, this is already uh, 1,300 meters deep snow skiing and also some risky, uh, slightly risky areas. And I purposely called it here um, dangerous. Uh, did I call it dangerous? Yeah. Yeah, dangerous areas and attention areas. So danger, what is dangerous? But to be on the safe side, if an unexperienced skier uh, skis down far behind the ski instructor or mountain guide, or more or less by himself. Uh, it's better, and something happens. If you, as a map producer, write, I indicated it is dangerous there, even if you know, yeah, it's just a pay attention area, you know, but not really dangerous. But to be on the safe side, if something happens, I can always say, <laughs> you see, I said it's dangerous. Huh? And, and this, uh, 
Did I call it the tension area? Yeah, I call it the tension area. So here you have to be a little bit careful. Here it may, another lunch might come. You always look up left. Is there something moving? Do I have to be fast and disappear down into the valley because other lunches might go down in this direction here or, or something here? So, yeah, and big parts, the last third is easy skiing down this, this slope here. And so apart from giving the absolute altitude and of course the uh, horizontal coordinates, I gave the total length, the range of the run, uh, 3.5 kilometers. The elevation, I calculated 13, it was in more than 50, uh, 1400 meters. The maximum slope inclination, and the average slope inclination. 42 degrees for a, an experienced skier is nothing. Huh? And here we have it. Huh? So that's the actual uh, steepness. The upper part here is a little bit steeper, but the last one is just enjoying. Huh? OK. And, and this is what, what we were supposed. I think we, we only made four or five of those. Uh, but basically, we were supposed to make it for every ski run which is uh, done by, by, the, by the local mountain guides. And now, a little bit of... Th this was a little bit of science, a little bit of cartography, and now a lot of blah, blah, blah storytelling. See how beautiful the mountains are and, and see how nice it is to study cartography in Dresden because then you get these chances. <laughs> okay, this is myself, and besides me, uh, my successor uh, on one of the paths up in the field, because the first days I just used to make these people, uh, uh, this lady, for instance, like the other one too, she stems from the flat north of Germany, not experienced in mountains, you know. Uh, they, they once spent 10 days in, in, in the Alps with me, but for the rest, you know. So it was, uh, it was up to me to, to introduce them gently into the mountain environment. Uh, here, uh, ah, actually, here we are up at this outlook where they wanted us to make an orientation information table, right? Very nice view, huh? I have to say. And you look into various valleys. So, yeah. Three hundred sixty degrees panorama for the Mirador Las Orchidias, or Orchidias, as they say. Uh, this means the. Was sind die Orchideen, Jan? Orchideen. You know these flowers, the uh, orchids? Maybe orchids. Yeah, the orchids outlook, because there were very, very nice orchids growing there. Ah, here. Yeah. Generation of uh, an annular panorama, circular panorama. This is just the individual photographs uh, joined, as you see. And here, based on these photographs, the outline uh, of uh, the, the contours. So this is the, the generation of the basis for this uh, uh, 360 uh, degrees uh, panorama information table. Or to so are these mountains without names? Or are they, they will come. But um, here you see, today you can do this automatically. When I was a student and I was in your stage, we still had to construct it very difficultly uh, by hand. Today you press the bottom and out of this in a few, no, nah, not in a few seconds. Yeah, maybe less than a minute. That's what you get. Nice. Huh? In reality, this has a diameter of twice this. This is 170. So uh, say 350, 350 centimeters, 3.5 meters. 
Here you see already what we got. The direction, the degrees even, and names where they are available at all. And there are not too many, too many names. As you see here, this one, no name. Uh, this one, we know the height from the map, but no name. But at least in this part here, we have quite some uh, geographic names. And here you get an enlargement for uh, showing the labeling, the name labeling, and all the other collateral information, like uh, showing this, uh, this little trail here, this path here, right? So once you have such a thing and you really stand there and check it out and say, aha, uh -huh, this has to be Cerro El Fraquita, uh, and it's three and a half thousand meters high. So this was a request by by the uh, hotel management, and I think it was a nice, uh, a nice cartographic task, which is different from normal map making. Huh? And I have to say, I was lucky enough because I was already first asked to to make something similar from the rooftop of the uh, airport building in Dresden, so that people arriving there and being interested they get uh, an arrow up, up to the roof and they can stand there and say, aha, there is the Czech Republic and up there it is in the far north is Berlin and something like this. So we made uh, a similar thing for, uh, for uh, Germany, for Dresden. And based on my experience from this, it was for me as, as the, the manager of this whole thing and, and Prof easier uh, down there at uh, Puma Lodge. As I said, three, four days, maybe in exceptions, five days, our little teams, I guess we had three teams or four teams, uh, set out, brought their own uh, little uh, lightweight tents with them. And uh, uh, at the very beginning, first we, first we made a sort of training outing, uh, check uh, if you are able to set up the tent, even if you are tired in the evening, and so on and so forth. So this is what you see here. And this is also during the beginning where we were, the whole group was still together as a sort of uh, get used hike up the mountains, including the mapping. So I showed them, uh, you're just walking. I mean, you're here to make a map. Please stop, make your drawings, make your notes, or even some, it was very nasty. We went up. Now you went for half an hour without stopping. Was there nothing? Please, <whistles> down again. Same distance again, but now making notes, drawing, and so on and so forth. And they didn't like that this jolly, Ha, 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 prof, he can be serious in here. No, no, quality first. I mean, you're here for mapping, not just for hiking and shooting some memory uh, pictures, right? Yeah, but here you see, I mean, this, this is not just uh, hilly terrain. <laughs> this is real mountains, huh? as I said, higher than 5,000 meters. And for, for these uh, people coming from the north of Germany or from the Ruhrgebiet, uh, from Dortmund and, and Hamburg. Wow. Huh? But they loved it. They, they are still talking about this today. And South American Andean uh, star sky. Uh, because you are high up, no air pollution. That, this is how you see the stars. And you guys from India m might have similar experiences once you were a little bit higher up. Anyway, once you go up, even say, because we mentioned Darjeeling yesterday, or um, 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 Missouri, up, up on Missouri, you might be able to experience such things. So for, for, for these guys, it was really something. And when every of these groups, I think we had three groups only, when they returned, um, are there the ladies here? No, one lady is here. One is still missing, yeah. The one who came later. Um, we had a joint meeting. Everybody brought, everybody brought 
their uh, results of field mapping and we sort of assembled everything, collected everything, assembled and uh, in this way based on discussion using uh, the, the existing uh, maps of the Instituto Geogra uh, Geografico Militar and our satellite image which we had brought from Germany uh, not in folded but in flat form like these ones here and the size the size of these two things was maybe almost twice as, twice as large as uh, those maps. Huh? So there we made our discussions and slow by slow uh, the maps began to grow. For you guys, because you should know about the, uh, the <laughs> get a little bit of background information, uh, this is also part of planning such a big expedition. No matter whether you are, uh, you are based at a four-star hotel or whether you are out in the open, like uh, during the expeditions with Jan, where we just had our tents and porters. Uh, you need to calculate this ahead, not while you are there, because then you might run out of food and, and, and things. Huh? So this has to be done before one kilo of onions and one clove of, uh, of garlic. Very important to stay healthy. Huh? Walnuts, you see everything, all that stuff. Potato chips, nice. You need salty material because you are sweating during the day. And this was then in the field produced by, by the students. Huh? Those are uh, photographs which I got from, from our students. That doesn't look that bad. Huh? Even, even for you as a vegetarian. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Mm. But we collected it, we brought it back, it was put into the plastic collector at Puma Lodge, at least. Huh? Yeah, this is just sometimes, uh, because we went off piste, so to speak. We didn't use the existing trails, also those, but frequently we just had to go up a slope somewhere, somehow. And this was going down a slope somewhere. And this should just show to you that it was not only easy, uh, easy hiking, comfort hiking, but sometimes it was a little bit more difficult. Like, for instance, approaching this outlook here, where I'm joined by uh, four students, five students, and, and uh, Professor Burkhardt, my successor. You had to cross rivers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not even just that deep, but a little bit deeper and a little bit more water. Uh, this would be a very nice video, in fact, but uh, I'm afraid. So we, we, we yeah, it doesn't work. We, we, we try it later. And because she tries to jump from stone to stone, but how to reach from here to this gentleman? Very difficult. And eventually she slipped off and she had to wait in the water, in the ice cold water, up to her knees. Uh, poisonous spiders might also be there. You, you have the same, I, I experienced some of these things uh, at the edge of the Ganges Plains up to the lesser Himalayas. So, uh, and in this case, better keep distance. Huh? I also told to my students, if they look so nice and they have such a nice fur and how are you doing? Du, 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 du. No, better not. Huh? So better keep distance. <laughs> because you never know. I, honestly, I don't know, is it a poisonous spider or not? But it was this size, hand palm size. Yeah, just one, one souvenir picture. Professor Burkhardt and five students. And here, that's how we, how we did it. Whenever, whenever something, a, a portion was mapped, you sat down and say, okay, this is still missing. We have to go here and there based on an interpretation of satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. And of course, in addition, the existing topographic map. But the major tool, so to speak, was during all my expeditions was satellite imagery. Same here. Huh? 
how far do we still have to go? This is a flat passage, and then it drops. Uh, where are we going? Are we going on the left side of the river, or should we simply cross it here, because here it's easy to be crossed, and then we go on the right side. So all these decisions uh, had to be made. And then, of course, I mean, it's a large area. Uh, are you simply going, uh, going up here, going down here, going up here? You, you cannot cross to this part, uh, then going up here. Uh, what are you doing? To what extent do, are you saying, forget about it. I don't care. I just follow this trail here. I don't go up this trail here. I follow the valley or maybe this this track here, da, 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 into the valley, uh, until this lake. And I don't care about the upper parts. Or are you still trying to get information? And there, um, what I call binocular mapping, played an important role. Every group, of course, had binoculars. And you were uh, sort of obliged to check the, all these areas because the, a rock drawing had to be included in the map. So you really had to check, aha, uh -huh, here there is still, uh, still debris, and here is hard rock. I have to draw the border in my map, and things like this. Huh? Or you just um, put your border lines in one. We also had A4 copies of the satellite imagery, not only these big ones. This was for joint discussion, but everybody had a set of A4 color copies, uh, uh, portions of the satellite imagery, and then you drew into those uh, the rock borderlines or the glacier borderlines or the vegetation borderlines down here. Huh? So uh, distance mapping, you might call it. I, I love the Ausdruck. In Deutsch it is Fern, Fernrohrkartierung, uh, Fernglaskartierung. Use your binoculars because you cannot go everywhere. Or here, borderlines of the glaciers. Huh? Do you really want to run there and run back in two, three hours? No, you won't. Of course, there, the, these guys still went there, but not up onto the glacier. But from here, you have a very nice view, and you can nicely, with and without binoculars, map the outline of the glaciers. Huh? And even the crevasse zones. The crevasse is very important for, for helicopter skiing. The, I still remember this one, because this is one of the spots where, during the, the first three, four, five days, I, I taught them the, the, te the technique of, of field mapping in these big, big mountain ranges. And I still remember that on this example, I, I uh, practiced binocular mapping, and I told them, see, there are some portions where you have no crevasses. There's the first crevasse zone. Here begins the second crevasse zone. Here is a portion without crevasses, but for the rest here, all crevasses, crevasses, crevasses. Uh, things like this. Mm -hmm. This is, so to speak, the binocular view. Overview without binoculars, and then you zoom in with your uh, binoculars. Here, in contrast, almost, I, I would not indicate any crevasses. There maybe might, might be some, some minor crevasses, but for the rest, this is simply a smooth glacier surface. Same here, uh, in contrast to those. And then, as a reward, hot springs. Uh, that's nice. That's really nice. And uh, I personally know from my various map, map, mapping activities, both in the Himalayas and in the Andes, we have less, uh, uh, fewer, fewer, uh, fewer hot springs in the Alps, at least in the Austrian springs, than in the Himalayas. And if then they, they are already tapped and you have to pay entrance fee, and you have a nice pool. But to be out in the open, like here, in, the, in such a little rock pool, and, and the water has 43 degrees, and you can, ah, this is nice. Uh, by the end of a harsh, hard uh, mapping day. And I, I said, please, 
only a photograph where I don't see the naked body. It might be I show it to female students and they should not be insulted. So, yeah. Um, in the valleys, of course, you can also use horses. And showing you this photograph, I have to tell you that during the last part of these six, seven weeks, no, no, five weeks only, of these five weeks, um, I was asked by another friend of mine, actually an Austrian mountain guide who uh, emigrated to Chile. Um, he wanted a map of a national forest west of the helicopter area. Same thing doesn't work, unfortunately, because you would see us riding here, Professor Burkhardt and myself. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Um, we went into this valley here. This is Rio Cipreses. It's called west of the helicopter area, and he wanted a 1 to 100,000 map of this area. Uh, was it even 1 to 50,000? I, I don't remember. So, my, my assistant... Uh, Benjamin, uh, my successor, Professor Burkhardt, Dirk Burkhardt and myself, the three of us with an asciendero. This is a, a local person, uh, a sort of farmer who joined us with, uh, on horse with pack horses, right? So we had, I think he had two or three pack horses uh, with our material, camping material, and we went for three, four days into this valley and did hard work while the students, we, they got a very small portion near the entrance to this national park to map so they had to do something but they could sleep in the hotel and then for three, four hours a day they did a little bit of mapping. Uh, but <laughs> you, you will see and this is why I was fond, um, I was in it, initially planning to you to to show you the videos, and, and hopefully we, I still can show them to you later today. Um, for instance, here he wanted to cross this river. Uh, the f horses fell, sort of drowned, were drifted away. He was able to swim to the other, to the other bank of the river, and here it's not, it's not uh, uh, so deep, so he could move, move up to here, but he was not able to go back to this side, while the horses were 500 meters or one kilometer down. But they were able to, to get also get up safely to the banks of the river. But still, those are things uh, which simply can happen during expeditions. And this would also have been a very nice video where we tried to save our, our local farmer with a rope. There was no other way to... We couldn't get to the other side, not even on our horses, because we knew his force, horses failed, so there was no way uh, uh, at this level of water to get to the other side. So, yeah, very nice things. Here you see another snapshot where we pull, tried to pull him over. First, I threw the rope to the other side. He, was, he tried to catch it, then to fix himself, and then, yeah. Um, this is in the very far south of the, of the area. No, where is it? Ah, I showed it in the very... Never mind. So this is in the very far south of this Rio, Rio Cipreses Valley. And we had to map up to these, uh, to, to these glaciers. Of course, we only went up to here. And the rest was binocular mapping. Uh, and here we are standing actually in, uh, above a very nice thermal lake with this color. Uh, this is not poison. This is uh, thermal water. Here you see our, our horses and uh, you can get in there and ah, it's gorgeous. And it's a very particular place because the ancient Indians, they already generated some petroglyphs, rock drawings. 
You see them here. And this is actually close to the previous uh, uh, site where this photo was taken. If you go five meters into this direction, then you are standing on these, on these petroglyphs. And this is really something. They are hundreds or maybe thousands of years old and maybe have been redrawn with a stone or with a hammer uh, by, by following generations, but still, the, this is impressive. Huh? And this is also one of the reasons why this valley is worthwhile hiking, but maybe uh, five people a month go there. So you, you feel alone, you feel lonely. It's not uh, like one of these alpine, uh, tourist centers where, where crowds are, are hiking there. So it's a very lonely, very beautiful valley and national park under protection. Uh, this is already returning from the, from the end of our, our ride back. And if you look, uh, he tries to smile, but if you look at his, his face, you can see uh, we were a little bit exhausted. And this is actually approaching one of our campsites. And you see, in ancient times, the, the, the Indians already uh, had some sort of outdoor agriculture, maybe some goats or sheep uh, here, and, and maybe they lived in, I don't know, in tents or little uh, wooden huts. Uh, anyway, the, the previous photograph was taken close to this place where we eventually camped. And if, you, if I ask you, is he fresh and jumping around, or does he rather look tired, I think it's rather the second. Huh? Uh, so you see, it was, it was a hard day. And this old gentleman here, he already laid down and slept. Huh? Lazy old guy. Huh? But really, it, for me, of course, being, uh, I don't know, 25 years older than him, it was even more more exhausting. So, but this was a very nice experience. And this, I wanted to show to you that if there is need, even within a short time of, of four days, uh, you can do a lot. You can reach a lot because um, uh, once you know the technology and both Benjamin, uh, our, uh, Janssen, my friend, my assistant, myself, and also my successor, <laughs> we know what mapping is. Huh? Yeah. And that's why. So if there is need, make sure that for, for a map somewhere from a remote area uh, that you, you have staff who, who is experienced in that. This is on the way back. It would also have been a nice, <laughs> a nice little video showing you that even the horses are getting tired. And at the very end, we still tried to impress the students. They were waiting for us. They knew. Uh, this afternoon, they have to come, and, and we just wait there and uh, welcome uh, the profs. Um, and we tried to galop a little bit, but unfortunately, yeah, to impress the students. I, I cannot show this to you. Anyway, we went back to Puma Lodge, and then they were allowed to enjoy, to go to the sauna, to go to the outdoor pool. And yeah, they look happy, and they look satisfied because they had done something they had reached some something it was not just holiday in the andes but it was joyful work rewarding work for them huh? and they are as i told you i still get emails saying prof i just want to tell you i got a new position at university blah 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 at map camping here and there company here and there but i i'm still remembering 19 uh, 2011, when we were jointly uh, in. So they liked it, evidently. OK. I purposely am not going to show you the pictures from the sauna, but this was it from, from the Andes. Uh, now. Uh, Let's try to continue, go back here. This was Puma Lodge. Ah, wait a second, I'm not, I am not doing it like this, but.
Yeah, the additional result of the end and field work at Puma Lodge was the last map which I showed to you. And no, there was no, no picture of it. But I, I can show it to you. Somewhere I have a picture, but we will, we will see it later. Um, so this was only based on this, these four, or was it four and a half, five days of very intensive field work. Ah, wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay, I go to Dokumente, Weise Kneipe. Ah, see? Haha. <laughs> This is the actual map. Here it says Rio Cipreses, right? Chile, uh, one, two, does it say the scale? I don't remember, uh, but it might, might have been one, two hundred thousand, yeah. And also very important for selling. Huh? If, if you, even if you work not for a company, but for, for a university, I always put here university, uh, te uh, Technische Universität Dresden, and then something German map quality, uh, just for selling. Uh, why not? And and this uh, this editor uh, tracking Chile, uh, they accepted uh, they accepted it. Uh. So it was in Espanol, English, and French. Um, here we gave the major the major places uh, uh, Reserva Nacional, so. National Park, uh, Los Cipreses, Laguna Puiquenes, uh, Quebrada Medna, this is a, a river, a side river, Rio de los uh, uh, Leñas, uh, and Rio Cortaderal. Uh, those are the major, major side rivers uh, from here, and, 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 and this glacier part, and, and there's a famous, a famous river going up here. So this is all mentioned. So if somebody says, ah, but if Rio Los Cipreses uh, is covered, are they at all also covering the, yeah, you can read it here. It is covered. Huh? So, and the students were just mapping this, this little thing here huh? <laughs> while we were covering all the rest up to down here. And yeah, also, I mean, this is not my, was not my idea, but why not? Huh? For tourism purposes, people know in this national park, you might be able to see a puma even, or this rare types of foxes, or an, an um, wie heißen die großen? Uh, a condor, right? Or one of these uh, papagais. Huh? Okay, so this is this side result, the additional result. Um, you have already, you guys here, you were already uh, exposed to, to various maps, and this actually is just a collection of maps from this working group of comparative mountain cartography. They have this outline, uh, and here always, this is the new outline with, uh, which I designed decades ago, uh, and this here is the typical uh, design of the recent maps from Trekking Chile. Uh, so all the Trekking Chile maps are of this design, and the old type, here it says also Technische Universitäten, German map quality, uh, uh, they, they were like this. Huh? And why I'm showing this to you is because, incidentally, I was lucky enough to have these two maps in Austria. As I told you, the rest is all in Germany, where I rarely go nowadays. Um, and there you can see, and this would be a task for the students to check the first edition and the maybe fifth or seventh editions. Are there any changes? What are the changes? And uh, yeah, this is the implication of this slide here. And in addition, uh, it should lead over to, a, uh, uh, to another uh, slide, which actually is this one here. And this is nothing else but the map and book 
uh, page of Tracking Chile. You see trackingchile.com. Find your trail, your expert for traveling and hiking in Chile. And here you see north, central zone, south, Patagonia, and so forth. Uh, wait a second. English, Espanol, Inglés. Let's go see. North, center, south, Patagonia, islands, and all Chile, whole Chile. And here we can now go through the rest. And yeah, I don't know, either we make a break right now or we make a break later. Um, and then I still have a little bit to tell you and until the end of, of the lecture. You are telling me, Jan. The Nevado, Nevado Ojos del Salado. Zack. And here you have got what we just visited, the Laguna Verde, you see. Uh, so uh, this company, I think this is very nice. Here, It's not very well focused, neither here on the projection nor uh, in the computer, but still you get some impression. And what they do is, normally they show three, uh, three pictures. One is uh, the, the cover page. You just saw it, the Alpenverein, the German Alpine Club map, uh, so that you know what you have to look for once you go into a shop and, and you, you want to order it. The next one is uh, a portion of of the, of the map, how, how, it, how the terrain is depicted, how is the hill shading, how is the rock drawing, are there any, any trails? Uh, for instance, here you see, you see the trail up the ridge here from the river and so on and so forth. Uh, how are they, or up to this volcano up there, how are they indicated? So you get this sort of impression about the map design. And last not least, um, uh, an image of the landscape, and this is a, a picture taken from, uh, from um, Ojos del Salado. Remember the, the video yesterday, we moved up this ice uh, couloir, this ice route here, to the summit of, uh, of Ojos del Salado. So, and I think this is pretty nice, although the quality is, is disputable, is questionable, but still, uh, there you get some impression, and this uh, does tracking Chile for all the maps. So even I planned, and for some times I had it uh, for my institute uh, für Kartografie at TU Dresden, we had a list of the maps we had generated. So if a student comes in, ah, wow, if I study there, maybe I'm also part of this team who generates maps, and in 20 years, my name is also given there. So it might be a motivation. I think it, it's, it's not that bad uh, if you do things like this. Uh, so let's continue here. And then, of course, they give all the, uh, they give all the uh, tracking Chile maps. Here, this is, for instance, one of the maps I I was never officially involved in, although I, I frequently, wait a second, I, I frequently checked uh, the quality. I did some map reading, map correction. Putre Lauka is in the very far north, actually. And this is at the borderline between Bolivia and Chile. Those are two 6,000 meter, 6,300 meter uh, volcanoes, very nice. Also, the northern end of Atacama Desert, and then you have these snow covered peaks, very impressive, I believe. I, I like the area very much. So, and this is the typical design of these maps. Um, although one cartographer from Dresden once uh, was involved in map correction, it's not. It's not saying uh, Technische Universität Dresden on the summit, but never mind. I just wanted to tell you that uh, in addition to, to all these maps mentioned here, uh, where, where it's not saying TU Dresden, 
you, uh, you still have uh, some maps where Teu Dresden, or at least myself, was involved. For instance, this is the one we just, we just saw. Let's check if, see, and here you can still enlarge these, these images, uh, or you can go here and also enlarge it. Uh, uh, anyway, so... Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, normally, what I did, since I knew some uh, some guys, some geodesists at the Instituto Geografico Militar in Santiago, I, I wrote an email there and ordered there. In the early times, we got the paper maps in rolled form, plain form, plano, and nowadays you, you simply get, uh, get the digital, both uh, any type of data you want, you can, they are freely available, yeah, yeah. And what portion of, of the work is uh, some kind of a identification of features uh, from satellite images or from... from uh, yeah, so we, we, we summed up all the all the necessary findings of information from any of the sources. So based on the existing topographic maps, we also, uh, we also uh, overlaid, for instance, the elevation contours of the existing maps with the elevation mo uh, contours we derived from uh, the available DTMs, say, uh, no matter of what source. Uh, in a very few cases, we even used uh, Pleiade and generated our own DTMs. And if there was a deviation, we rather believed in our, in our elevation contours than in the old ones. Because uh, I know how quickly they sometimes say, ah, it's already five to six. I, sh I should go home and I still have to finish this map sheet. And sometimes the, uh, the stereo restitution was a little bit on the, on the wake side, I call it. Huh? It was a little bit careless. Huh? So anyway, we tried to optimize all these informations for our maps. And yet, in, uh, for instance, there is no map where not somebody uh, was either uh, uh, somebody from Trekking Chile, uh, from my friend, uh, his name is Franz Schubert, like the famous composer. And he's also, he grew up in Vienna close to where Franz Schubert lived uh, before he went, uh, he went to Chile. So either Franz Schubert himself or some of his friends went there, or uh, in 80 or 75 percent of all the maps, one of the Manfred Buchreutner students went there, uh, or I myself. Uh, so this, for instance, is uh, 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 San Pedro di Atta, Atacama, the recent edition, uh, or even a, a, a newer one. This is the edition from... Anyway, we will find it. L look at this one here. Was this the one we had? No. Yeah? Uh -huh. So the animals were jumping into the map. How can that be? Uh, but you see here, uh, there are uh, many more, many more images. So you get a good impression. This is also in the Valle de la Luna, in the Moon Valley. Uh, ah, this is one of the of these outlook peaks uh, to the uh, northeast of uh, the Salar de San Pedro. the city of San Pedro. So I think it, it's nice to get some, some idea. In the backside. Uh, okay. Now, and to cut the long story short, uh, I just wanted you to, let's go back, how can I make this? 
Ah, I have to close it first. Anyway, yeah. So, ah, for instance, Torres del Paine, you know, these famous rock towers in the south of, um, of uh, Patagonia. And for instance, I spent there a week checking the, the map quality. I just did it for free because I had a project uh, in, uh, in Antarctica. I had to fly down to, forgot the name of this space, this air base, uh, anyway. And for, for one week, I said, OK, I go there and check the map quality. And uh, uh, even here in the back, you, uh, this is all the people mentioned. You wouldn't find my name. But one of my uh, diploma students, who actually now runs a cartographic company as a one-person uh, company, very successfully. He's, he, he fell in love with a lady. Sometimes things happen. In Chile, he lived for three or four years even, well, maybe five, in, in Chile. Because I asked him, or I asked him would you love to, uh, like to, to do your master thesis in Chile? Yeah, yeah, I would. Da, 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 da. So he went there. And then he, stayed, he, he sent me an email, can I stay a little bit longer? I think I can find some jobs uh, working for maps, blah, blah, blah. I said, OK, stay as long as you want, improve your Spanish. It's always good. And during that time, he fell in love with this Chilean lady. Now they are married. And she finished her PhD at the university in Chile. And uh, they both are living in close to Tübingen. Uh, in, in the southwest of Germany. So they went back to Germany. And he's still running his cartographic company. And he, this guy was actually responsible for the map sheet of uh, Torres del Paine. And he gave me the digital data. And I had my laptop with me or my tablet. And in the field, I, I, I checked it and gave some comments. And yet. I'm not mentioned, but I simply do it because he is my student. The editor is my, German, uh, my Austrian friend, Franz Schubert, so why? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this was uh, the north. I'm, I'm wondering why. Ah, because this is not actually mentioned, but under, amongst bestsellers. So I'm happy that I once was into, uh, was in the business of generating a bestseller map. Uh, OK. And then uh, this is how they do it. Then uh, after the north, you have the center. And in the center, wait a second. There should be, aha, uh -huh. Altus de Tenno. I think this is an interesting map. I'll show it to you later. Uh, I, was I was involved in Archibueno. I was involved in the surrounding of Santiago. I was involved in Cajon del Maipo. This was actually one of the first maps by one of my oldest master students. This is just east of Santiago, the house mountains of Santiago. Uh, and yeah, by the way, let's, let's have a quick look. Because nowadays, um, they even, uh, yeah, this is the type of area. Just uh, a 30-minute bus drive from, from Santiago huh, in spring. Excellent skiing tours, excellent mountain hiking. And here you see uh, the overview of the, of the whole map. These things were not in the first edition uh, which my student made, but this is maybe the fourth or fifth edition because it sold very well. It sold very well uh, since it's so close to Santiago. Actually, Santiago would be, say, just here. This is the rims, the, out, the periphery of Santiago, somewhere here, just west of uh, the map frame. Mm -hmm. And uh, here in the east, yeah, this uh, should be turned. This is north to the left. Uh, here you have a 6,000 meter peak. And many, many tourists want to climb a 6,000 meter peak. So the map sells also in, in this context very well. Here you get the fee. The Fuchu uh, Plantat and, and Cerro uh, Andrade, Ruta Normal, so the normal route up to this 
a peak, and so on and so forth. Mm. Okay, now let's check, send, go back to center, if we can. Yeah, here. Uh, what else is here? Condor circuit. I, I, I was not involved in this one. This is close to the hotel of my friend Franz Schubert. And, but you see here, there are more maps, nine maps. Ah, Costa del Mauer, Piedras y Montañas. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a very nice handbook where I believe this is the one where I'm co-author. Uh -huh. um, it's published by the University of Talca. Uh, it's, this means about rocks and mountains, the geology of Maule. And down here would be the names of the authors. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, written by this one student uh, who I just mentioned who went from Chile with his Chilean wife now to Germany. Very nice geological explanation. I, I don't know any, any similar book which explains the, uh, the generation of our Earth as it is uh, in, in geological terms with so nice pictures and so nice simulations. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous book. Why, how, how is the erosion by the waterfall? Why is there an overhang, right? This is all explained in, in these nice, nice pictures. So it's, it's a fantastic book. I think it was published in, wait, let me check. There should be some more information. It was published in, uh, I will have options. Ah, out of stock, see? Cannot be ordered anymore. This is why, maybe why they are not giving additional information. Huh. That's good. 20 US dollars and sold out. Huh? So a surprise to me, but evidently the book, when, when people go to the book shop, they say, ah, oh, it looks nice. I buy it. 20 bucks, nothing. Huh? So it's really a, a, a very nice book. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. Um, and... Any further? Ah, wait, wait, wait. Uh, there should be Alta Cedeno, Condor Circuit, La Cajon del Maipo. Uh, Plomo, also, also dressed and involved. Yeah, anyway. So, and, and then finally, after the central part, here we have the southern part, the south, Chiloé, uh, Cochima, ah, Willow Willo, for instance. This is a very nice map uh, of, a, of, a, of a national park where I was nothing else but asked to check the trail markings and the information uh, tables along a very famous one week round or five days route, a hike, multi-day hike, because uh, they knew me there, they knew I'm not only a cartographer, they wanted to produce, produce this map, this was one target, and the other one to check in the field to what extent the quality of their trails, of their hikes, is equal to alpine standards. And since they knew, I have, I've been guiding in the Himalayas, I've guided in Africa, Kilimanjaro, and everywhere, and all over the Andes, they said, Manfred, please, can you do us a day? I, I stayed in a four-star hotel, wonderful, Echo, Echo Hotel, blah, blah, blah. They gave me a porta, they spoiled me, and I had only the task of saying, mm, this table is not sufficient, please add this or that or change this and that. And there people get lost. There is no marking. The trail cannot be found in the forest and there is a branch and another branch. Where do they have to go? I know, because I'm a mountain guide, 
but somebody who comes from Amsterdam and New York, downtown, he doesn't know a Delhi downtown. <laughs> so, and, and I gave them all these hints, and I stayed there for eight, nine days, had a wonderful time, and, and this is the map <laughs> you see here. And it's a gorgeous area. Just look at these waterfalls. You are passing through jungles, uh, beautiful mountain lakes, and so on and so forth. The whole is, whenever you hear about Wilo, Wilo National Park, uh, yeah, it's, it's in English and in Spanish, uh, uh, this map. It's, it's a wonderful area, by the way. So uh, I have to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. South, what else? Do we have to show? Ah, by the way, Cochamo Puelo. Uh, this was also a map of, of my student, um, uh, student I just mentioned before, the guy Josef Lademan. And then here, this was one of the very first uh, Lankihoe and Longkimai. This volcano, doesn't it look gorgeous? Huh? Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but this was at the very beginning also of, of our activities there. And this, this guy also eventually, he stayed for one year in Chile. He said, Manfred, can I, can I stay there? And he made not only uh, his master thesis, but these two maps, Lankiwe e Longkimai and Longkimai. Uh, Pukon also, for the second edition, I, I stayed there for two weeks and checked map quality. Uh, wait, I show you this this volcano. Uh, here you see it. Oops, uh, for free. No, I, I, even, I even paid the hotels. I, I, uh, so <laughs> I paid some money just to work there. Here you see this this gorgeous volcano. Uh, here you have a view. Isn't that magnificent? Uh, down here the jungle. And up there, the glacier-covered uh, volcano. Uh, I, I love it. And it's, it's a real volcano. Up here, you see a little bit of, of smoke coming out. And, and when I was there, really, there was the, the, boiling, uh, uh, the boiling red lava cooking in, in the hole of the, of the crater. And, and a little bit of smoke was coming up. And I just surrounded rounded the whole crater there. This is gorgeous. Uh, yeah. So not only the Himalayas, also the Andes. <laughs> and this is, this is uh, the backside of the map with some detailed maps of the volcano and, and the lakes. And of course, again, giving the, the animals. Well, OK. Let's stop here. I could mention four or five more maps from the Andes. But I wanted to show you this one. Uh, uh, this is one of these typical maps produced by one of my PhD students. Uh, this is 26%, as you see. Now, let's move up to 100%. Tuck, tuck. Now you have it 100%. Oops. Mm. Apologize, apologize, apologize. I want to go here. See, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the legend. Very, 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 very important. And uh, just very much in brief, the normal things, the roads and trails, uh, water, we just call it water, we could call it lakes and rivers, whatever. The border lines, both the international, the district borders, and very important, the national park boundary. This is also Alto Steteno is, uh, is a, a national park. The, a lot of vegetation information. Evidently, evidently, there are many people interested in that. Remember the Kilimanjaro map. Huh? But the, the colors here are much 
sub, much more subdued, not as strong as the African ones. Huh? Because here it was uh, us in Dresden and the guys in Santiago who were responsible for the coloring. And no, no African said, stronger colors, we have to have red and blue and uh, okay. And then, of course, a lot of tourism information, a mini market, a monument, hotel, bungalow, restaurant, shelter, camping, holiday house, hiking trail, trail with some climbing patches, uh, horse riding, rafting, kayaking, uh, the access spots where you can enter the river, uh, a cycleway, uh, waterfalls, uh, and a, a thermal spring bath. Last, not least, where are police stations, peaks are indicated, and so forth, and, and so on and so forth. And in this case, there's a famous gypsum cave. Also, a Yeso uh, uh, La Cueva particularly indicated there is a gypsum cave. And then, of course, all this background, the impressive information, the first edition in 19, when was it? Uh, 2013, first edition. Who is, uh, who is the publisher? Uh, Via Chile Editores in Santiago, together with the Foundation Tracking Chile uh, of my friend Franz Schubert. I was uh, responsible for the coordination in uh, contact with Franz Schubert. And the other guy is also a German guy who owns uh, this editorial company Via Chile Editores, based in Santiago, and uh, the guy who, me, who you met already in, in the Andes and in the Himalayas, Benjamin Schroter, who is going to Nepal with uh, Jan Krupacek this year. Cartographia by myself and, and my, my master student, Christine. Ah, the base data, basic data, Instituto Geografico Militar. Then who made the field work? It was Christine, I sent her there. Um, revision of the map, map critical map revision by myself. Uh, what type of projection? We used UTM 19S. Uh, uh, who made the cartographic design? Myself with my master student. Uh, who created, in this case, the digital terrain model? Another friend of uh, Jan Krupacek and myself, one of my, he's actually the chief assistant of mine and now of my successor. Uh, who made the, the city map uh, in, in the back? And so on and so forth. And last not least, published 2030. This is not the, the final edition. This is why here we have still some, some dots. This was the last but one digital version which I got for proofreading and I said no mistakes it can go into printing. Uh, so and yeah please. Some are, some are. Uh, just think of the one I, I made of Chimborazo and, and uh, Chimborazo and Nevado, uh, and the other one, these two maps, right? Uh, but for the rest, uh, with such a uh, consistent, big, in numbers, uh, map series, it's only Chile. Yeah. And this is due to the initiative of my friend Franz Schubert. And the funny thing is, I was at a geodetic research uh, lab in Concepcion once. And the, it is a joint Chilean joint venture. It was set up by the uh, Geodetic uh, Center in Frankfurt, BRGM, huh? and many years ago. And they invited me. And this German guy there who was in uh, the head, uh, the chief there 30 years ago, I don't remember, he said, Manfred, you are Austrian. You know, there's still another Austrian mountain guide up in Talca. I know him. He, his name is Franz Schubert. Maybe he's, he's interested in a cooperation with you. So I went up to Talca, and we got to see each other and became friends. 
ein Franzet. You are a cartographer. Du, du bist ein Kartograf, ich brauche dich. Kannst du nicht? Du, wir machen eine big, a big große Sache. A map series of Chile. Und das haben wir dann auch gemacht. <laughs> That's how it worked. Okay, but just, uh, just to browse this map, I think, I think it's, it's, it's quite a nice map. And you see also different colors for the, for the uh, glaciers and for the lakes. Here's the Laguna de Teno. Um, uh, oops, here in the, uh, I wanted to show you the glaciers. Here, here you have this typical uh, green, sort of greenish blue. It's a slightly too blue for the glaciers. Uh, but basically, uh, or you see the, the, the very intense green for the, for the national park boundary. But basically, I think it, it, it became a very nice map. Huh? So this is one of, of the examples how, how our, our maps look. And if I'm a master student and after finishing my MSc, I can say, see, this is what I made. It's nice, isn't it? I think it's, if I were a student nowadays, I would be happy. One to 150,000. Okay. Let's go back to... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ah, maybe I can... Or, now, let me immediately show you this one. Yeah. This is... A very bad example of the of the snow avalanche risk map. It's the one and only snow avalanche risk map of South America, which I made based on an algorithm I developed in the 1980s for the Eastern Alps, where I generated the first snow avalanche risk maps of a ski tourism area in the Austrian Alps based on some pre-work by a friend from University of Innsbruck. He made some, he's a geophysicist that made some theoretical uh, assumptions and, and calculations. And I sort of improved that and made it ready for map application. So I made it so simple that eventually after taking all the input data, making a complex calculation, by the end I got a patch of uh, a, 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 an area of patches with a, a high degree of danger, of risk, a medium and a low degree, sort of, huh? including the surface cover. When you have uh, trees and shrubs and bushes, it's less than once you have only a, a, a meadow where the snow simply rushes down, clearly. Um, the wind direction, because if you are on the loof side, uh, uh, on the lay side, then, or lee side in English, you, all the wind is blown over a ridge and you get big uh, thicknesses of snow and a higher degree of risk, clearly. Huh? So all these parameters have been included and I used this very, very old algorithm, gave, uh, gave this information to my student Josef Lademann, the one who is married to the Chilean lady, and, and he, together with me, we generated this map. Uh, and it's, it's a, a, a famous uh, ski touring site around this lake. It's the Lago di Maule, up at an elevation of 2,300 meters, so not very high, but still uh, high, uh, high enough up in the, uh, in the Andes to, uh, to still have a, a, a enough snow. And unfortunately, I have no other picture. Uh, and this is actually from, from the Trekking Chile uh, map list. This is this lake. And around here are very gentle, very gentle uh, hill slopes or mountain slopes. But in the back, you can see once you, once you climb up this summit here and ski down here, uh, it's already a little bit steeper and more risky in terms of avalanche. So uh, my friend said, many, many people from the lowlands are going up there and they have no experiences no, uh, about uh, snow avalanche risk. Manfred, how about making such a map? And this is how eventually 
uh, it came into being.